Good afternoon. My name is Amanda McKenzie, and I'm the library director at East Georgia State College. Along with Jessica Palumbo, assistant professor of English, I would like to welcome you to our Big Read Small Talk Lecture, Life Under Jim Crow, 1890 to 1940, or to whenever, <laughs> and which will explore the lives of African Americans during the Jim Crow era. These lectures are part of the NEA Big Read, a community-wide reading program made possible by grants from the National Endowment for the Arts and the Mill Creek Foundation. These events are based on Ernest Gaines' novel, A Lesson Before Dying, and will continue through the end of September. If you don't already have a brochure, please pick one up on your way out today for a full schedule of Big Read activities. Um, these brochures and also some free copies of the book are located on the table right outside the auditorium if you need one. Wednesday at Franklin Memorial Library, the public library here in Swainsboro, at 3.30 p.m., there will be a screening of the movie version of A Lesson Before Dying for community teens. We also hope to see all of you at convocation this Thursday, September 22nd at 11 o'clock here in the auditorium at EGSC. Dr. Marcia Godet, a leading scholar on gains from Louisiana, will visit our campus to share more about the author's life and works. Next week, there will be a community movie showing and team book discussion at the public library and a free jazz concert on Friday night, September 30th, which will be our closing Big Read event. And now I am pleased to introduce Dr. Jeff Howell. Dr. Howell is an assistant professor of history on our Statesboro campus. He has a PhD and a master's degree from Mississippi State University, a master's of divinity from Mid-America Baptist Theological Seminary, and a bachelor of arts from the University of Mississippi. This is his eighth year teaching at EGSC, where he teaches courses in U.S. history and Western civilization. He has published chapters in the U.S. history textbook, The American Road, and has a forthcoming publication titled Hazel Brandon Smith, The Female Crusading Scalawag from the University Press in Mississippi. He is married to Anita and is a father of a 10-year-old boy, Justin. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jeff Howe. Well, good afternoon. That was weak. Let's try that again. Good afternoon. All right, there we go. Um, ooh, that's loud. I appreciate the opportunity of being here. Um, I, re I read for the first time last week uh, A Gathering of Old Men, and if you have not read that book, um, it, it is a great book to start your journey through understanding um, the concerns of African Americans. And, and if you read the book closely, it's in the 1970s, and many people don't think of the Civil Rights Movement being in the 70s. They think of the Civil Rights Movement somehow ending in the 60s. And as you see on the screen here, I have Life Under Jim Crow, 1890 Until. And originally, I titled it 1890 Until 1940. But as I was thinking about it over the weekend, um, I thought about an episode of my childhood that I thought applies to why I put question marks. When I was a kid, there was a snake in my yard, and you know, being a little kid, I was deadly afraid of snakes. And my father went out with a hoe and chopped the head off the snake. And if you've ever seen that happen, what happened after that? Yeah, the snake was dead but the body kept wiggling, okay? Jim Crow, in many ways, was decapitated in the late 50s with the Brown decision, um, with the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act of 1964 and 65, um, but the body is still wiggling, okay? Jim Crow is dead, but we still have vestiges of it, a residue of it in our society. Okay. Uh, we, we, we've seen that with the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, we've seen an episode yesterday where a black man is shot by the police, and I'm going to let the process take care of itself. I don't know all the details of that, but that is still a problem that we see uh, in 2016. So Jim Crow in many ways is dead, but Jim Crow in other ways is still around. Now, you may ask, wh what would... What does a 51-year-old man know about the black experience? 51-year-old white man. 
Quite honestly, personally, I don't know anything about what it's like to be black. So let me explain to you how I got to uh, where I am. Uh, I grew up in Mississippi in Holmes County, which is right in the middle of the state, which was also, without my knowing it, uh, the hotbed of the civil rights movement in Mississippi during the 1960s. Um, I grew up in a county that's about 75% black, went to a segregated academy from the first grade to the 12th grade. It didn't dawn on me when I was six years old why, why I was on a bus with all white kids and there were no black kids. It didn't dawn on me when I was playing Dixie League baseball as a 9, 10, 11, 12 year old while the little black kids were standing on the road watching us. I just thought that's the way things are. It wasn't until I was in my teenage years and I went to work in my grad, dad's grocery store that of course working in a, 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 a town that's 75 percent black, 75 percent of the people who came in the store were? Y'all can answer it's okay. <laughs> African American. So I ended up working mostly with young black men and women I ended up carrying out the groceries of black men and women. And I came to understand, you know, vaguely from talking to people, um, what the black experience was in Holmes County. Not saying that, you know, really had an understanding of that. Um, when I was, I would think, a junior or senior at the University of Mississippi, I had to take a um, class to finish my minor in English. And I went in one class and the professor said, well, what we're going to do is we're going to go out in the graveyard and we're going, to write, we're going to write down the catchy sayings on the side of tombstones. And I said, not me. <laughs> so I dropped the class and I went on. And I was like, well, what can I take? And there was a class. I was going through the whole list of possible English classes I would take. And one said, survey of black literature. And I said, okay, that looks interesting. So for the first time in my life as a 20-year-old kid, I read uh, Zora Neale Hurston, and I read Richard Wright, and I read of uh, the uh, Harlem uh, Renaissance and things of that nature, and that began to expand my understanding of um, the black experience to some degree. Later, I was a Baptist preacher for 15 years, and there, I met a lot of wonderful people over the years who were open-hearted about a lot of things, but I found out that in the late 90s, even in the late 90s, that many of my parishioners were not open to hearing sermons about racial reconciliation. They were not open to the idea of a black person attending church. And this is still, this is rural Mississippi in the 1990s. And that really um, affected me and bothered me. Then in 1999, I uh, came to have the great joy of being an uncle of a biracial niece. And um, my redneck radar came out all the time. I began to look at how people looked at her, and I'm like, what are you looking at? What, you know, she's a human being. She's a wonderful person. And so these, these kinds of issues... Um, really began to open my eyes to some degree, as much as they could, to the black experience. Then as a graduate student, I had to write a master's thesis. And not really knowing what I was doing, I went to the library one day to do some research, and I began to research um, a white newspaper editor that actually was in the county that I grew up in. I didn't know anything about her when I was a kid. And I found out that she was sort of caught in the middle of the Civil Rights Movement. Well, that led me to study the Civil Rights Movement of Holmes County, Mississippi, where I grew up. And then later, I worked for two years uh, for the African American Studies Department at Mississippi State. So in all of those experiences, um, I have read many books like A Gathering of Old Men and have come to, while not personally understanding the experience of black people, at least appreciating uh, the experience of black people from all the you know, dozens and dozens of books I've read, articles I've read, books that, articles that I have written, and just the experiences I've had with African Americans and their retelling to me 
um, what it was like to live in the Jim Crow South in the 1940s or 50s or 60s or even the 70s, which is my own lifetime. So as I'm standing here today, I, I thought, what can I tell you about life in Jim Crow? And as a white man, I can't tell you anything. But what I can do is share with you black people's voices, okay? And what they encountered from the end of the Civil War up until today. Now, before we go any further, let's define our terms. What in the world do we mean by Jim Crow in the first place? You see the picture on the left, that is, that is an artist's rendition of what Jim Crow was. What you've got to keep in mind is unlike us today, um, as many of my CATS students, as I see David standing back there, um, when I make, give them an activity and I say, break down for me during the week what, how you spend your week, many people put Netflix three, four, five, six hours. I'm like, oh, that's why your grades are so low. You're, you're, you're Netflixing yourself to death. Well, in the 1820s and 30s and in the post-Civil War era, you didn't have Netflix. Okay? You went to live presentations. And one of the presentations that, that went on in, before the Civil War and after the Civil War were known as minstrel shows. So this is where you would go see sort of like slapstick comedy, people singing songs and, and, and performing sort of in comedic operas, if you will. Jim Crow was a, a minstrel show, and the term was coined by a minstrel show creator by the name of Thomas Rice. And in this minstrel show, he created a black figure by the name of Jim Crow, a crow being black. Jim Crow being a black man. And in, the, in these Jim Crow minstrel plays, um, black people are, all, are usually ridiculed. They're the buffoon in these stories. They're lovable, but they're backward and this kind of thing. And this became, over time, the nickname for black people, Jim Crow. And then by the post-Civil War era, the word Jim Crow simply became the word or phrase that was used for either traditions or laws that separated whites and blacks in the United States. Um, when you read the book, um, A Gathering of Old Men, there are multiple themes of what life was like in Jim Crow. If you read the book, there's always the threat of lynching. Okay, In lynching, when you think of lynching, lynching is not simply hanging someone. Lynching is any kind of extra-legal mob violence that leads to murder. So you could be shot, and that's technically a lynching, if you were a black person who, were who was attacked by a mob and murdered, in some, whether, whether through the actual hanging or shooting or burning to death, as happened many times, that is considered lynching. In the book, there are the themes of police brutality and injustice. This was a common experience that black people faced in the post-Civil War era well into the 20th century. There was the constant fear of daily indignities. If you've read the book, um, these poor people working on this, these sugarcane plantations are basically ignored and forgotten and only, are only important as much as their labor can be exploited. These are all examples of what it was like to be a black person living in the deep south where you're expected to be for the most part nothing but a field hand and even in the cities it was very clear that you were living in a separated bifurcated society. There were places you went and there were places you were forbidden from entering. Also throughout the book there are themes of economic exploitation um, there are themes of sexual exploitation. If you've read the book, one of the characters, I forget which one, his sister went to prison because she stabbed a white man who attempted to rape her. So the white rapist gets off easy with a few cuts and the victim actually went to prison. And yet, in this book, there are also themes of black resilience. Matthew, all through the book, is a man. He doesn't take crap off of anybody. Even the sheriff, while he's beating these other black men, trying to beat a confession out of them, 
he does not do that to Matthew. And, and spoiler alert if you haven't read the book, at the end of the book, these, these older black men who have been basically victimized their, own, their, their entire life, they find this Hemingway-esque courage where they say, I would rather be brave and be punished for it than keep living um, on my knees and in fear. All right? So these are some of the themes we're going to address in my talk today. Um, the best way I thought to go about this was to simply share with you episodes that I have come across in my uh, 10 to 12 years in academia. Okay? There are many others that I could share. I'm just going to share probably half a dozen, you know, briefly mention them and just give you just a brief glimpse of what it was like to be black in the United States post-Civil War, we, you understand what I'm about, post-1865 um, until now. All right? An example would be in Colfax, Louisiana. Black people came out of slavery in the Civil War with the hope of gaining um, full equality, with the hope of enjoying the fruits of citizenship, which meant the vote, which meant the ownership of land, which meant um, political participation, things of that nature. But Reconstruction began to unravel in the early 1870s. The United States was undergoing one of its worst economic depressions in its history by 1873. The federal government, which had basically in, uh, put on the South the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th Amendments, abolishing slavery, giving black people citizenship and giving black men the vote, basically began to turn its eyes away from the plight of black people. As people were moving west and you've got problems with Native Americans and you've got all kind of economic issues um, in the urban north. And so black people in Colfax, Louisiana found themselves by 1873 surrounded by white Louisianans with the goal of doing nothing else but reinstituting white supremacy. And as you can see by this um, historical marker, on April the 13th, 1873, a group of former Confederate veterans marshaled their forces together. The African Americans knew the writing was on the wall. They gathered themselves near the courthouse and, the, and then a battle ensued. Many African Americans and a few whites were killed in the process. Most of the African Americans were killed after they surrendered. So basically, they were executed. All right. Now you can see, even by this historical marker, you can see the perspective of the people who put the historical marker up. I guarantee you this was not put up in 2016. This might have been put up in 1956 or whenever it was put up because it said this event on April the 13th, 1873 marked the end of carpetbag misrule in the South. Okay? That is basically a white Southern perspective that lasted well into the 20th century. That Reconstruction was nothing more than the North enforcing its terrible will upon poor white Southerners when, in my opinion, real historians will say, uh, or credible historians will say, that what Reconstruction was was an attempt to elevate black people to citizenship. And by 1873, 74, 75, 76, that movement was slapped down. Okay? So African Americans came out of Reconstruction hoping or came out of the Civil War hoping during Reconstruction to gain a measure of equality. But they will not find that until well into the 20th century. And thus Jim Crow begins to take root in the 1880s, 1890s, where you began to have a more separated society, where you have a white train car and a black train car. If there are black schools at all, the white schools are going to be given a lot more money on a normal basis than the black schools. Um, in my research in, in Mississippi, during the Depression, when Mississippi's not spending a lot of money at all, period, on education, white or black, 
They were spending about $32 a year per white student. They were spending $7 a year per black student. Right? So that, that gives you an idea of what Jim Crow was. It was a system of inequality in any way that you could shape it. All right? One of the things that has hit me as I have studied this topic is I kept waiting to hit rock bottom. I kept thinking there's coming a day when in my research that if you're studying all this period that it's going to stop, that it's going to get better. Most of the time in the study of this Jim Crow era, you never find the bottom. Because just when you think you can't read or research some other kind of horrific event, you find another one. All right? um, over 5,000 black people between the 1880s and the early 1930s were lynched okay, across the South. Uh, Mississippi and Georgia were running neck and neck. Okay, and I didn't mean that to be a pun. Um, Georgia lynched close to 1,100. Mississippi lynched uh, right below 1,100. And what a lot of people don't realize is one of these lynchings happened in Statesboro, Georgia in 1904. Okay. In 1904, two black men, Paul Reed and Will Cato, worked on the, on the farm of a white family. The entire white family was murdered. Okay. The suspicion fell upon Cato and Reed. Um, I forget right now which one's wife. I think it was Cato's wife confessed that she had heard him admit to it. All right. So they were found guilty in a court of law. Okay, process worked. Somebody committed murder, somebody investigated, they found out, and so forth. Okay, so let's just go with it at that point. Well, these two men were supposed to be publicly executed, which was a, com you know, a way that you dealt with people convicted of murder back then. You legally hung them. But what happened was a group in Statesboro rushed the courthouse and pulled these two men out of prison or out of jail and said that a legal hanging was too good for them. And they were marched outside of the city limits of Statesboro. And, I, and Dr. Upchurch and I have tried to figure out exactly where this was, but the, the landscape of Statesboro, of course, has changed in 120 years. It's hard, to, you know, it's hard to figure it out. But as you can see here, this is an actual picture from the event. They were taken somewhere outside of town, Statesboro was a big um, producer in turpentine at the, at the time. These two men were chained to the tree. They were doused in kerosene oil. They begged to be shot, hung, killed in some way, but please don't set me on fire. And they were torched all right, for all to see. And people, after they were burned... People came by and picked up bone for souvenirs. Okay? Now that's bad enough. But in the days that followed, several African Americans, many of them having no connection whatsoever to Cato or Reed, are murdered in the process of this backlash of the white community. So many black people left Statesboro in 1904 that their white landlords did not think they would have enough people to pick the cotton when the cotton came into full bloom. Okay? This kind of event, ladies and gentlemen, I wish I could say was an aberration that only happened once or twice. But this was a common event across the South from the 1880s well into the 20th century. All right? um, another example... I came across in researching for the book that I'm, I'm publishing in, in the spring about Hazel Brandon Smith, the, the, the white newspaper lady I told you about earlier. Um, there was a man named Sam Edwards. He was a member of the Coast Guard. And in 1931, he was traveling through Holmes County, where I'm from, um, in order to see his mother in the next county. He was pulled over for a minor traffic incident and was taken to court and made the mistake of admitting to the justice of the peace that he had never picked cotton in his life. 
Now, this is, this is not Sam Edwards, but I put this picture up just to give you an idea what a chain gang looked like. The judge, when he heard that Sam Edwards had never picked cotton in his life, he said, I'll take care of that. So he put Sam Edwards on a chain gang for 36 days where he was beaten for drinking one cup of water, excuse me, for drinking two cups of water instead of one. He was beaten for picking less than 100 pounds of cotton. The only way that he survived this experience was that he bribed one of the guards with a fancy watch that he had somehow kept hidden and he got out of there and he, get, he promised he would never be back in central Mississippi. All right. Black men and women were arrested on very minor things most of the time and put on chain gangs during the 19 teens, 1920s, and 1930s because it was a cheap source of labor hired out to large corporations digging coal or iron in Alabama, picking cotton or sugar cane in Louisiana and places like that. This was a common everyday experience for African Americans during this period. Now, we all know who that is, right? What did Jackie Robinson do? You won't get an F. Somebody give me an answer. What did Jackie Robinson do? Okay, play, good guess. Okay. He, he broke the color barrier in 1947. What most people don't know is Jackie Robinson was a kind of Rosa Parks before Rosa Parks. In 1944, Jackie Robinson was an officer in the U.S. Army. He was in Fort Hood, Texas. And he was told that um, army officers, even black army officers, would not have to obey segregation laws on the base when it came to riding on the bus. And in this episode in his life, he is sitting next to a light-skinned black woman that the bus driver mistook for a white woman. And the bus driver stopped the bus, went back and cursed at Jackie Robinson and told him to get to the back of the bus and Jackie Robinson being a very proud man, and I can't use the language they used, basically told the man where to go with it, and to the point that there were almost fisticuffs thrown, Jackie Robinson was arrested by, by military officials, was put up on court-martial, taking up into court-martial proceedings, but eventually the matter was cleared up. I want to read to you a quote from his autobiography, I never had it made. He said, there I was, the black grandson of a slave, the son of a black sharecropper, part of a historic occasion, a symbolic hero to my people. He's talking about when he integrated baseball. The air was sparkling, the sunlight was warm, the band struck up the national anthem, the flag billowed in the wind. It should have been a glorious moment for me as the stirring words of the national anthem poured from the stands. And he's fixing to tell you this was the first day of the World Series, so the first World Series he'd ever been in. Perhaps it was... But then again, perhaps the anthem could be called the theme song for a drama called The Noble Experiment. Today, as I look back on that opening game of my first World Series, I must tell you that it was Mr. Ricky's drama, the owner of the, the, the manager of the Dodgers, and that I was only a principal actor. As I write this 20 years later, this is in the early 70s, I cannot stand and sing the anthem, I cannot salute the flag, I know that I am a black man in a white world. In 1972, in 1947, at my birth in 1919, I know that I never had it made. Now, in recent times, we've had the episode of Colin Kaepernick refusing to stand for the national anthem, and now many other athletes have done that. And I'm, I'm neither going to praise them or criticize them. I just want you to understand that even in the life of a veteran of the U.S. Army and who is a national sports hero, he is talking about he has a love-hate relationship with the United States because what he had to endure as a black man all the way up until his death in the early 1970s. Okay? What I try to tell people sometimes is you've got to, uh, whether you agree with what someone has done or not, you have got to step back from your life and your experiences and to some degree, as best as you can, step in their shoes and see their perspective 
and it may open your eyes to a whole different view. Speaking of another black veteran in, in the research that I did in writing my book, Maceo Snipes was a black man who lived in Butler, Georgia. If you know where Butler is, uh, I go through Butler every time I go back to Mississippi to visit my mother. You go from um, uh, Macon and you go south and then you go through Byron and, and Reynolds and then you go through Butler on your way to Columbus on Highway 96. In 1943, Maceo Snipes joined the Army. He served 30 months, six of them in the Pacific. He received an honorable discharge and he came home to, well, I'm loud. He came home to Butler, Georgia and planned on exercising his rights as an American. He went during an election in 1946 and voted in the Democratic primary, which was something a black man in, oh, I'll move my microphone. I'm sorry, I'll move my microphone. Um, he did something a black man was not supposed to do. He voted in an all-white primary. The next day, someone knocked on his door, and when he opened the door, a group of white men were on his porch. They shot him, and he died. Later, they claimed self-defense, and the courts uh, agreed with them that it was self-defense. What happened in reality was that Maceo Snipes was trying to exercise his right as an American citizen and as a military veteran, and he was murdered for it, and his perpetrators were never brought to justice. Um, in other research I've done on Holmes County, I came across a man named Chalmers Archer, Jr. He was one of the first men to be in the Green Beret program in the late 1950s, early 1960s. He was one of the military advisors sent to Vietnam to train South Vietnamese uh, freedom fighters at the very beginning of the Vietnam conflict in 63, 64, 65. He later was an educator in Virginia. He grew up in Holmes County, Mississippi in the 1930s. And this is what he said, quote, children and teenagers in Lexington were often held in city jail for no other reason than to be taught lessons. He would later say that one of the weirdest things he found about Jim Crow racism is that white Lexingtonians would come to them, black people, and say, you're happy, right? You're alive, be happy. And this is what he said, and I quote, uh, yes, we were alive. Safe and secure, no. Content, no. As human beings, we did not lose hope of someday being able just to visit the public library of our choice, or any library for that matter. We desperately wanted to feel safe from abuse when we walked down the street, to be able to look in a shop window or just watch the sunset without fear of physical harm, to have entitlements the same as other people, to have the same opportunities as other races whose kids were born with an edge so comprehensive as to constitute unlimited entitlement. He said at the end of his book that in the, in the mid-40s he was really feeling angry and feeling what we would describe in the 60s as militant, and his parents said, you got to leave, because if you make a stand, you're going to die. Okay? This was the choice of an angry black man in Mississippi in the 1950s. All right? Some of you may know who this individual is on the right of that picture and the right of that picture. Anybody know who that is? Anybody? That is Strom Thurmond, the former senator from uh, South Carolina for decades. In 1948, Strom Thurmond headed the Dixiecrat Party, uh, which was a political party of disaffected Southern Democrats who were not happy with Harry S. Truman because Harry S. Truman in 1948 desegregated the military and in his tenure as president, during his tenure as president, he began to put forth a civil rights commission. Okay, let me read to you something that St uh, Strom Thurmond said in 1948, um, talking about the possibility of black people being treated equally and voting in the South. He said, there's not enough troops in the army to force the Southern people to break down segregation and admit the in race into our theaters, into our swimming pools, into our homes, and into our churches. 
So he's basically saying black people are going to be integrated into white society over my dead body. Now, what is ironic here is this is his African-American daughter. Okay? Her name, she, she died in, er, in the early 2000s. Her name was Essie Mae Washington. Her mother at age 16 was Strom Thurmond's maid in his home. Strom Thurmond was 22 years old and took advantage of this 16-year-old woman and impregnated her and never recognized his uh, paternity of this biracial daughter. He paid Essie Mae Washington's mother money to keep her quiet over the years. But even in the last days, he never acknowledged his daughter. Now, Thurman's family later would acknowledge her. But her father never acknowledged her. And so while during his career, he made a career of saying no to integration in schools, in public life, it's pretty obvious he did not mind integration between the sheets. Okay. Um, as you can tell, this is not a pleasant topic, but it's a topic that has to be addressed. Other examples of what it was like to be black in the South in the 1950s. Okay. Um, you may recognize these pictures. The woman on the left, this black, young black woman here, is Elizabeth Eckford. Anybody know who she was? Elizabeth Eckford was one of nine brave black students that tried to integrate the um, little, uh, Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas in 1957. The problem here was that Elizabeth Eckford got the meeting place and the time wrong. So when she arrived at the school, as you can see from this picture, she is turned away at the door to the school by the Arkansas National Guard and hundreds of screaming white Little Rock people are yelling at her all kind of vile racial epithets. She is in her 70s today and she still has said she suffers from post-traumatic stress from basically facing an entire screaming crowd by herself. This young little girl right here is Ruby Bridges. Ruby Bridges was a young woman who integrated a public elementary school in New Orleans all by herself. Um, and once she was integrated with these federal marshals, many of the teachers refused to teach her, so she had one teacher that entire year and her bravery inspired the Norman Rockwell painting where you can see here people were throwing tomatoes and yelling all kinds of things at this little girl simply because she wanted an education and simply because she was black. All right. Um, time is running out so let me touch on some of these briefly. Anybody in here ever heard of Medgar Evers? What's amazing to me is, is everybody, of course, has heard of, of um, Martin Luther King Jr. And I'm not diminishing Martin Luther King. We're going to talk about it in just a second. Medgar Evers was a man like Maceo Snipes, came to Mississippi, came home in 1946 as a veteran of World War II, tried to register to vote, was met at the courthouse in Decatur, Mississippi by shotgun-toting whites, and was turned away, but he determined the rest of his life that, I thought I had a picture of him, hold on, did it not work, yeah there he is, um, thought that he was going to vote, he was turned away, he spent the rest of his life from 1946 until he was shot in the back in 1964 by Byron D. LeBeckwith, simply because he, sh Byron D. LeBeckwith was a white supremacist and a Klan member who shot Medgar Evers in the back simply because he was promoting equal rights. His murderer went through two mistrials or hung juries, hung juries in the 60s. And it wasn't until 1994, using the same evidence that was used in 1964, to convict Medgar Evers' um, murderer. Hopefully we all know who this young man was. This was Emmett Till. Emmett Till came to Mississippi in 1955 to visit relatives 
Um, he was told to be careful about his step. He supposedly uh, made some kind of suggestive remark to a white woman that owned a local grocery store. That woman in turn told her husband and brother-in-law, and you can see here how Emmett Till ended up. They, took, they kidnapped him from his grandfather's home, beat him, shot him, threw him in a Mississippi creek or river, sunflower, the Sunflower River, and that's how his body was found days later, bloated and disfigured. His mother, Mamie, uh, basically said, I don't want his, his face to be fixed. I want the world to see what was done to my child. His murderers were acquitted, but then later they were paid by a Look magazine reporter and admitted, oh yeah, we did it. So this is, if you read the book, you see these kinds of themes. These are not just themes in a book. This is real life. Okay. This is what African Americans endured um, on a daily basis in the Deep South. Okay. This thing back up. There we go. All right. Let me touch on two, hang with me for a little bit longer. Um, this is Hartman Turnbow. Hartman Turnbow was a member of what came to be known as the First Fourteen. In 1963, he and his wife and several other African Americans, um, with the help of student workers, guys your age from the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, taught these black farmers how to go through the voter registration process. Hartman Turnbow came out in April of 1963 to vote, was met by 30 police officers and attack dogs and was asked, which of you want to vote? And he brave questions like, how many bubbles are in a bar of soap? And how many hairs are on the back of a donkey's back? I don't know about you, can you answer those questions? I can't. And he failed the examination. A month later, he woke up to his house on fire. But this was an African-American male you didn't mess with because he came out with a, a 22 rifle and drove his attackers off. But then the sheriff came that day and arrested him for burning down his own house. Okay? Um, this is Alma Carnegie Mitchell. This was, this was no spring chicken. This was no 18-year-old uh, idealistic college student. This was a 75-year-old woman in the 1960s who decided, much like... Um, Others, she was sick and tired of being sick and tired. And she registered to vote, and she marched in protest for civil rights. And in 1965, um, she and hundreds of others were arrested by the Mississippi Highway Patrol for marching to Jackson for civil rights. And when I read this, I dropped the book. I just, I just could not believe what I was reading. She was arrested, and she and hundreds of others were put in the in the livestock pens of the Mississippi fairgrounds because that was the only place big enough to hold all these protesters. So here is a 75-year-old woman for eight days had to sleep on concrete and sit on concrete in a pen like a cow because she simply wanted civil rights. Okay? So when somebody comes up to me and says, well, you're a, hist you're a history teacher, yes, and they'll say, well, you know, isn't this stuff over with? And I'm like, if you'd gone through this, would you forget this? If this was your grandmother that went through this, would you get over this? Would you quit thinking about this? Um, these, kinds of th these kinds of things, this is happening in my lifetime. Okay, I'm born in 1965. This happened the same year. He was almost murdered two years before I was born. So this is not some far away thing. This is modern times. Now, you will hear many times today, Martin Luther King, um, he's almost denuded. He's, he's, he's almost um, neutered. There's nothing threatening today when you hear people talk about Martin Luther King Jr. I hope you can tell by this picture, Martin Luther King went to jail 29 times in his career. Um, and when people would say, you know, there, there's a better way or a better time to protest, he would say, this is what it's like being black in America. There is no better time for protest. The protest is now. This is what he said in the um, famous letter he wrote from the Birmingham jail, and I don't have time to read all of it. Let me read some of this. 
You deplore the demonstrations that are presently taking place in Birmingham, but I am sorry that your statement did not express a similar concern for the conditions that brought the demonstrations into being. In other words, you complain about our protest, but you don't complain about the situation that brought about the protest. We know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. For year, And I'm skipping through some of this. For years now I have heard the word wait. It rings in the ear of every Negro with a piercing familiarity. This wait has almost always meant never. We have waited for more than 340 years for our God-given and constitutional rights. I guess it is easy for those who have never felt the stinging darts of segregation to say wait. But when you have seen the vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, brutalize, and even kill your black brothers and sisters with impunity, when you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she cannot go to the public amusement park that has just been advertised on television and see tears welling up in her little eyes when she is told that Fun Town is closed to colored children and see the depressing clouds of inferiority to begin to form in her little mental sky and see her begin to distort her little personality by unconsciously developing a bitterness toward white people and he just keeps going on. And when you take a cross-country drive and find it necessary to sleep night after night in the uncomfortable corners of your automobile because no, motor, uh, no motel will accept you, when you are humiliated day in and day out by nagging signs reading white and colored, and when your first name becomes, and he uses the N-word, and your middle name becomes boy, and your last name becomes John, and when your wife and mother are never given the respected title Mrs., and then he just goes on, he says, there comes a time when people are, wa are tired of waiting for that to happen. Now, the question arises, are black people simply victims in this story? And the answer is, of course not. Okay? Um, black people gained civil rights because they fought for them, because they died for them, because they marched for them because they petitioned Congress for them. Despite the efforts of groups like the White Citizens Council, despite mountains of voter fraud, despite the attacks of groups like the Ku Klux Klan, black people have overcome. But the struggle continues. You say, why did I put this up here? Where's the birth certificate? Um, I thought when President Barack Obama became president in 2000, nine, that maybe America had turned a corner. And in many ways, I think we have. To be positive, I think we have. But for eight years, we have heard things like this. Where's the birth certificate? Or he's not an American, he's a Kenyan. Or he's not an American, he's a Muslim. Or, as I heard a pundit over the weekend, there's something other about Barack Obama. Now, I don't care if you're a Republican, Democrat, libertarian, tree worshiper. I, do, I have no concern whatsoever what your political affiliation is. But when you simply for eight years tell people that the President of the United States is not an American, ladies and gentlemen, that's just racist code. So Jim Crow, the head's been cut off, but the body is still wiggling. Let me give you some sobering statistics as I wrap this up. In the United States today, the average median income of a white family is $53,000. The average median income of a black family is $35,000. The percentage of Americans in poverty is 14.8%. The percentage of African Americans in poverty is 26%. 28, excuse me, the percentage of civilian employees, um, black and 16 over who have worked in management, business, science, and arts and occupations is at 26.6%. For whites, the percentage is 37%. Black people are arrested four times more than whites over marijuana possession. Those statistics show a greater number of whites use marijuana 
and marijuana busts make up half of all drug arrests. Between 2015 and up to this early part of 2016, 732 whites and 382 blacks were killed by the police. Whites make up 62% of the population, but only 49% of those killed by the police were white. Blacks make up 13% of the population, but account for 24% of those killed. A black man, according to the Washington Post, stands a two and a half times greater chance of being shot in the United States than a white man. Jim Crow is dead, but the body still wiggles. And nobody would deny, of course, that we've come a long way. Here we are, an integrated audience, okay? Here we are where we have a black president. Here we are, Georgia is served, um, and right now it's next, by, by um, John um, Lewis, uh, a great civil rights activist and, and a great congressman. So we have made great strides. But I was teaching a couple of years ago, and I just off the cuff said to my class, I said, I think that the civil rights movement has had a great success, and I think things are much better for African Americans. And I, and I believe that. But and a, a black lady in my class, probably about 60 years old, raised her hand and she looked at me and she said, yes, but you don't have two sons that you worry every time they leave the house that something might happen to them because they're black. And I had to admit, I, I do not know what that's like. Right. So I would say that we have come a long way, but I would also say we have a long way to go. So what do we do with this? Well, first thing what we do black or white, is we educate ourselves, okay? One way you could educate yourself to some degree about the black struggle would be to read the book, A Gathering of Old Men, to watch documentaries like Eyes on the Prize, which is a great series and a great book, to watch a movie like Glory about the first black um, civil, uh, civil war um, army unit, all right? Inform yourself about the world, all right? Every day I am trying to read something, not, not just, just about civil rights, but politics and everything else. I'm trying to inform myself. Young people, I'm talking to you right now. You know what scares me to death about a lot of people your age? You don't read. That just scares me to death, okay? How would I learn about the world and about experiences I can't ever have if I don't read about it, okay? But not only read about it, involve yourself with people of different colors and different backgrounds and different perspectives. Change your world as your world changes your perspective. And in closing, let me say this. I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, one of the greatest joys of my life has been to study history and to realize that this country is full of heroes. Heroes that you may have never heard of like Hartman Turnbow or Maceo Snipes, um, people like that who the, for the most part the history books have forgotten. But these people have shown me as I've studied the black experience that I need to be thankful for what I have um, I need to share it with other people. And at the same time, I need to work as hard as I can to make my country a better country. Thank you. What do we do now? Has anybody got any questions? I don't promise to have all the answers, but I will try to do the best I can to answer any questions. Sure. Um, I, I have met people that have a completely different memory than what my research found. I don't remember any of that happening. And I'm like, well, here it is in the newspaper. 
I, I, I don't make it up. It's, it's right there. Um, I, I have had some Facebook discussions, heated Facebook discussions, with people over things like the place of the Confederate flag in society and, and um, how things were, say, 40 or 50 years ago. Um, but, but I had that when I was a Baptist preacher. Um, I mean, I, I've had people who will listen to me preach all day about hellfire and brimstone, but I preach on ra racial reconciliation, and you can see the hair on the back of their neck. Now, this was 20 years ago. I'm, I'm hoping it's better now than it was then. Um, I, wa I once pastored a church that I was just digging through the file cabinet. I was just curious what was in here and found the church bylaws, which were written in the 1940s, and it said, Negroes will not be allowed in our church, and if a Negro, I just still remember, a Negro is how it referred to it, um, we will cancel services. And I can still remember um, when a young man came to the service the next week, he'd met a young woman from Miami, and, and she was not biracial, she was like triracial, she was black, Portuguese, Spanish, but she looked, you know, African American, and you could just see people just, and I thought, well, this is going to be fun, you know. But I tell you what, she won them over within like two meetings. All of a sudden, she became because they got to know somebody. They moved beyond a color and met a person. Um, so I, I really have not. Let let let, let the book come out first, and then, and then we will see. Um, because the, the book is about a white woman that believed in Jim Crow, affirmed Jim Crow, was staunchly supportive of Jim Crow, said that in the 40s, if blacks and whites integrate, there's coming a race revolution, a race war. And when blacks began to push for civil rights and people began to shoot and all this other stuff, she said, wait, 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 we, we can't do that. And her entire peer group turned to her and said, you got to get on the same page as we are. We're all about stopping blacks from integrating. And she said, well, I don't believe in integration, but I don't believe in killing anybody over it. And all of a sudden, she is a pariah. As the book title says, she's a scalawag. She's a traitor. She's a communist. And then by the early 60s, she's an, she's an ally of the civil rights movement. Okay. Um, and so here's, here is a... a um, beacon of society but once she steps outside of the Jim Crow narrative of blacks can't be equal and she says well maybe they can be she gets crushed and but what she goes through is nothing compared to what people like Alma Carnegie Mitchell go through being pinned up in a in a cattle pen for eight days like she's a you know piece of livestock or something so you know. I, I, I'm pretty sure because I know some of the people that, at least I know the names of the people I wrote the book about. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see how that comes out. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Um, I will, the, the, Okay. The book takes place, the, the, the book is a biography of her. So she lived in Holmes County from 1936 until um, she had Alzheimer's and dementia and had to leave, and her paper just shut down with no, no farewell, no celebration or anything in 1985. And then she dies um, nine years later, 1994, uh, destitute in a nursing home in Cleveland, Tennessee. So most of the book takes place in Holmes County, but it is taking the context of the South. So like the Maceo Snipes Butler, Georgia story is in my book. Um, and there are many episodes of, of the African American experience in Alabama or in Georgia or you know in other places. But we also deal with things like um, James Meredith, who was the first African American to try to integrate the University of Mississippi we deal with uh, the Freedom Summer. We deal with her reaction. What's amazing in the book, not because I wrote it, just because I share the story, 
of like when the Civil Rights Act comes out in 1964, you see her reaction, which is very temperate and very objective. She said, well, I don't know how this is going to work, but she says, I don't have any problem with black people voting and all this kind of stuff. Whereas the rival paper, which was put into play to put her out of business and to give the straightforward Jim Crow line, says, you're a traitor and this is the death nail of civilization and all, all this kind of stuff. So you've got this two different perspectives on many events that happen throughout the 1960s. Um, you've, you've got like the uh, uh, Mac Charles Parker event. Um, he's one of the last men that, that we know was publicly lynched in the United States. In 1959, uh, in South Mississippi, he's accused of raping a white woman. And before he ever comes to trial, a group come in because the jailer left the jail unlocked. They take him out across the Louisiana line, shoot him in the head, and dump him in the Pearl River. Well, Hazel Brennan Smith writes editorials, and she says, Mississippi is not going to be able to outlive the shame of this. It needs to be investigated. It needs to be prosecuted. And the rival paper says, well, this is what happens to black rapists. Deal with it. Okay. So you've got, you got two completely different perspectives. Uh, what's ironic is the term political correctness today. You see what was politically correct in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. If you said, I am for everybody having equal rights, that went against political correctness in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. So. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Oh, sure, absolutely. 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 Yes. 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 Boston, Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. I know what you're saying. Sure. Well, George Wallace, same thing. George, George Wallace was 1963, segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. And by the late 70s, he's elected as governor of Alabama by an overwhelming black vote. But that was because he went into black churches in the early 1970s and publicly apologized uh, now, was that a, a true change of heart, was, or was that a smooth politician? Probably a little bit of both. Uh, and let, let me, let, you, you make a valid point. Let me make sure that you understand.